Let's get started then. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. We are absolutely delighted to be joined by Dr. Nick Lowe, one of the world's leading expert uh, dermatologists and, and skincare experts with over 30 years experience in dermatology. You are without doubt an absolute pioneer in research and studies into aging and skin problems and uh, lecturing now at uh, UCLA the School of Medicine in Los Angeles and obviously running the highly successful Cranley Clinic as well in London. So welcome Dr Lowe, we're, we're absolutely delighted and honoured to have you with us today. Well thanks Hayley. How are you, how are you doing in, in all the uh, Covid-19 turmoil at the moment, how are things going? Well I'm doing a lot more walking with our dog, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> frustrated that I can't get out on the golf course but anyway oh, and, fr and frustrated that I can't get into the clinic but uh, we will we will uh, get through it. Mm. Yeah, are you, are you feeling quite positive or are you having up well, and down? Well yeah, po positive but uh, it'd be nice to know some uh, more time frames I think that would be, uh, I'm sure that will be coming down the in the near future but uh, that's that's a little bit uh, frustrating not knowing time frames but anyway yeah. we're fortunately touch wood we're all well oh good good well um are you, are you keeping in, sorry are you keeping in touch with some of your uh, colleagues and friends over in the us as yes well? yes indeed yeah no i stay in touch with them and do uh, both by emails and uh, skypes and so forth yeah they're um yeah. both in uh, in how they, la how and, they find you uh, are they all closed and locked down the clinics they there, are pretty they? much yeah it depends right. on the states but uh it's interesting some of the states uh, my daughter for example she's a economics professor in north carolina and they um have far fewer cases than in other parts of the country so there are different states that have uh, different degrees of lockdown the worst is obviously New York, and LA is actually catching up with New York. But at least with LA, you've got less, um, more, less congestion. So it's a more open city yeah. than the congestion in New York. So we'll see. It's uh, crazy uh, times. Absolutely. Mm, crazy times. Absolutely. So I've been doing my homework on you, Dr. Lowe, and. Uh, one of the things I found really interesting was that you were one of the first of, of only three people to inject Botox into somebody in aesthetics. So that must have been a bit of a, an, an exciting and interesting day. Talk, talk us through <laughs> the launch yeah. of Botox. Well, it, actually, this year is the 30 year anniversary of uh, some of that first um, uh, Botox aesthetic uh, research. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, clinical research uh, at the time with a variety of different pharmaceutical companies and one of which happened to be Allergan. We were doing a lot of research on some of them at the time newest anti-psoriasis, uh, anti-acne products um, and they had been approached by uh, Dr. Alistair and Jean Carruthers, the dermatologist and ophthalmologist at, uh, from Vancouver who had been doing some of the early, they'd observed that uh, Botox, which was being used for strabismus corrections and uh, also for blepharospasm, uh, also uh, reduced some of the um, uh, hyperfunctional uh, facial lines. So they approached me to do and help design uh, a fairly robust placebo controlled study. Um, so we started that about 30 years ago and um, that eventually led to its um, f uh, approval by the FDA for initially labella mid-forehead lines and we also observed and during that study that not only did you reduce the some of the vertical and horizontal forehead lines you also uh, if it was injected in the correct locations you actually got some uh, brow lifting uh, so it was quite interesting and then we moved from there and to doing some of the dose ranging studies on the crow's feet the as they were called the lateral cancel lines um, and then uh, so yes that was uh, all very interesting I think we were very in fact when if I recall 
um, Alistair Carruthers and myself actually presented a uh, seminar at one of the uh, American Academy of Dermatology meetings and people in the audience, uh, some of whom later became, I would say, Botox enthusiasts were um, highly skeptical of our wisdom of injecting a neurotoxin into people's faces <laughs> for cosmetic purposes. Anyway, so that was the background history there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we started also do, I did some of the pivotal studies on getting the approval both here and in the States for its use in hyperhidrosis. So yeah, we've been involved in that from the word go really. And, and actually you've contributed to over 450 studies in skincare and dermatology, aesthetics. I mean, where do you get the energy to, to do? Well, I used to, I used to have a lot more energy than I do now, but I'm still <laughs> ticking along. Um, yeah, we've, uh, the, um, no, I had a very busy clinical research program initially at UCLA. And then when I went part-time UCLA and, uh, private, we started our own private clinical uh, research foundation in Santa Monica. And then when I opened the clinic in London, um, in 94, uh, then we continued doing some clinical research in the UK. And, uh, so that's why a lot of the publications are based on that research. Some of them are, uh, the early publications are based on clinical case reports and case series of uh, what I like to call real dermatology, not the, uh, yeah. not the aesthetics dermatology. Yeah, the real stuff. Skin problems. Can, can I jump in? Ro rosacea we'll talk about soon because um, it's obviously Rosacea Awareness Month this month, so it'd be quite interesting to, to go on and, and talk about you know, your insights into rosacea. Sorry, John, I interrupted you then. Yeah, shall I? Oh, what are we I going to say, John? I'm not sure. Sorry, I, 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 my internet's a bit flaky. I think. I, I, I'm really interested in you, in what took you to the States in, in a way. I know you studied over here, but um, I, I had an op opportunity to work out in California doing PhD physics postdoc work at, at right. Beckman. And I wonder, I remember going through that process of, of, of getting a green card and things like that. What, what, how did you, uh, what took you from the UK to the US? And yeah. I, I guess it was a great decision. Well, the Beckman, where you were in, uh, in Orange County at Irvine, of course, was one of the centers of, uh, of um, uh, uh, certainly skin research on lasers and other things. So yeah, no, that's yeah. a great center. Um, yeah, what took me there, I, I would, I'd finished my um, training in, in, as you had to do then, general internal medicine, uh, followed by dermatology. And to get really good uh, opportunities in dermatology, academic dermatology, you had to really do a, a research thesis, an MD by research thesis, um, at least uh, in the States. Uh, well, not in the States, anywhere, but it happened that there was much more research yeah. going on in the States than there was in uh, in the UK in dermatology at that time. So that, I was offered a research fellowship at um, down the uh, the coast from uh, Irvine at uh, UC San Diego, Scripps Clinic La Jolla in San Diego, yeah. and that's what took uh, me and the family there. Um, and that then I when I decided, should we stay there? Should we come back? I wanted to do more research um, uh, after the fellowship had finished. So what I did was to stay on, applied for a green card, and we stayed on and I was eventually offered a professorship at UCLA, which then led to staying there long term. And we're actually all the family, uh, UK, uh, US citizens, as well as UK citizens. So I became a, a U.S. citizen about, um, I guess, 30 odd years ago. So uh, that, that was my story there. And um, then why did I move back yeah. part time initially to the U.K. was because one of my daughters decided to apply for medical school. She got accepted um, amongst other places at, uh, in the U.K. So we thought we'd open up a quiet little clinic to have something else to do where we were visiting here uh, with her and that's why we started the Cranley Clinic in London and that was in 94 while she was still at medical school. So that's Fantastic. sort of a brief a brief encapsulation. Um, so yeah it was uh, it's an interesting um, 
uh, uh, journey. Um, for many years, for about 18 years, I was running my, or actually my wife, fortunately, the only reason I could do it is that she is the uh, business brains and the administrative brains. So she ran the clinic both in the UK and in the US while I was backwards and forwards every four weeks. So um, that's that's the, briefly the story. Fantastic. Did, when did you get involved with lasers for the first time then? Was that over in the States or? Yeah, it was over in the States because uh, one of my interests um, was in photobiology and we were doing a lot of research on um, phototherapy for psoriasis, on um, the evaluation of uh, sunscreen, sun protection. So I was doing a lot of work with photobiology and um, then uh, keeping up one of the, the, the centers, obviously, and still are, uh, is the um, uh, Harvard uh, Mass General Center, where uh, Rox Anderson and um, John Parrish at the time had just uh, come up with their concept of the selected photothermolysis and had uh, developed yeah. the first pulse dye laser. So I managed to persuade UCLA um, with both dermatology and plastic surgery to acquire the second or third pulse dye laser uh, in the world. And we had one of those at UCLA and that in those days occupied two rooms you may remember them, uh, or you probably know. You probably not quite no, remember see. those. Um, but one room. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one room contained the huge uh, containers of uh, liquid dyes, and the other room contained the actual laser technology. So it was a question of. Uh, it was quite interesting and quite um, uh, unreliable. But uh, we did some of the early uh, evaluation of that in things like. Um, port wine stains and in erythema, facial erythema scars, including uh, facial erythema and uh, rosacea. Mm. Yeah. And was that was Rox Anderson? That yeah, Rox or... Anderson did uh, develop that first laser with uh, John Parrish, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Fantastic. So now you're, you're in, you're still splitting your time between both America and here, or you're just here now? No, about the last five years, I decided we could. I didn't need to spend that time on the uh, on the plane. So um, we still have homes in LA or Santa Monica, but we are based in mainly in the UK now. And um, so now I've focused on the UK for the last five or six years. And what do you think? Um, is the key to running a successful clinic if you were talking to somebody who's just starting out their journey in uh, dermatology or uh, with a, a laser clinic you know what are the the pearls of wisdom that you would impart well i mean i think it depends what sort of uh, level of clinic you're trying to develop i mean you can certainly a, a lot of people now that one of the big problems of uh, and we, i think we were one of the first to open a standalone clinic in in um in the uk uh, in 94 where we had all the facilities in the clinic including all the lasers i think we were one of the first to have about four or five laser systems in a private clinic and the problems are the um overheads and expense and the other problems are that to keep it ticking along you need enough enough staff so you really need a good administrator uh, which I was fortunate to have uh, and still do with my wife, who's an ex-physiotherapist, but also a financial planner. So you need to get a good administrator business mind. Um, and then the other thing is, I think if you're going to try and deliver the highest quality, you really do need specialist training and preferably to be a specialist in one of the, um, shall we say, uh, uh, established specialties. Uh, I always like to think dermatology, um, plastic surgery, head and neck, etc. If you're developing that level of uh, expertise. And then the other thing to do is to really um, train your staff. I think really adequate, really top staff training, use the 
the laser companies or the other device companies to help in that. Um, they're always uh, worthwhile. So I think a mixture of things. And then, of course, you need the patients. So um, uh, certainly in private practice, you, uh, you never used to need uh, PR in the old days, but uh, sadly or rightly, you do now. Um, so that's certainly a thing that's evolved. And it's given opportunities to clinics who can start and uh, use a lot of PR to jumpstart their patients. Um, we were lucky that we were able to use our experience, I guess, and our reputation to build that patient base. So it depends where you're coming from, really, what level. It's interesting. We say a similar thing to people. It, 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 sometimes it depends how fast you want to grow in terms of like the financial aspect of things. You know, I'll, people will frequently ask me how much marketing budget do I need per month to, mm -hmm. you know, run this clinic. And I'll say, it depends completely on how fast you want to grow the business. You can spend an awful lot of money on marketing, but you, or you can spend nothing and still be successful because of your right. patient recommendations and your referrals, but it will grow much more slowly if you do it that way. But yes, you then don't need the spend. And you know, certainly right now, what you're saying with regards to financial planning, Oh, wow, we're all feeling how important that aspect was of the business, aren't we? You know, th those clinics that have really got that financial planning in place are probably feeling a, a lot better about the next couple of months and how that looks versus versus ones that haven't. So, seeing some yeah, I mean, it will be really interesting to see how many clinics uh, survive this uh, this particular experience because mm. um, uh, we're still doing uh, quite a uh, teleconsulting and those patients that are needed but that's mainly the dermatology patients uh, rather than the aesthetic patients and so um, I think that's that's it will be interesting to see what happens and uh, I think a lot of clinics who are certainly highly leveraged as regards their um, uh, loans and equipment may have problems we're fortunate that I think we're in a good uh, position to uh, re-expand uh, re again once we're allowed to mm. but uh, yeah it's 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 we're in unknown territory as regards that mm. i'm interested um again i'm picking on the idea that you were in the us and the uk because there's not many people fall in, you know into the category where you've got experience in both uh, countries but but did you i always think the, the people in the us know how to do this better than we do you know, do you think that's true? Did you get some great ideas that you could bring over from the US to uh, into the UK clinic scene? Yeah, well, in the early days, certainly um, when we were opening the London clinic, we modelled it on a much smaller version of what I had in what we had in Santa Monica, uh, and that was we had the lasers, we had the uh, the I was determined to open up a, uh, a clinic that offered top class dermatology expertise as well as aesthetic uh, procedures and evaluation rejuvenation etc and some of those early um lasers we were lucky we we actually some of them were developed in the in the states there are other similar systems very good systems that were being developed in in the uk and in europe um, and in uh, israel another sort of hot spot in those days for technology so we were able to use some of the experiences we'd had in the States to bring over things like um, the uh, computer pattern generated uh, CO2 lasers, the um, variants of the pulse dye lasers, the variants of the, um, of the Q switched uh, in those days Ruby before we moved yeah. into the Q switched Alex and ND YAG. So, all of those we were I was able to uh, select from the experiences I'd had in the States. Yeah. yeah we have a question. But I think the other thing, the other thing that's interest that was interesting is that uh, nowadays, I mean, in, in in the UK at the time, most um, dermatologists that were doing some aesthetics, and there were very few, they were all working uh, out of private hospitals 
where the hospitals would acquire the uh, lasers and that wasn't necessarily the lasers that I thought were the optimum. So I was fortunate that because it was a standalone clinic that we owned and ran, we were able to select what I thought were the best uh, bits of equipment for our needs. We have a, a question from the audience. Um, how would you go about selecting a laser to buy in today's market? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think you need to uh, decide what type of clinic uh, pattern of patients you're going to offer. If you've got a relatively low volume of patients, I think you, and you don't want to spend, have an enormous overhead, what you need to do is to select a versatile unit. Uh, I mean, it was always said in the old days that uh, uh, a system that offered a, a, the ability to treat many different things didn't do any one particularly well. I think that's completely um, been reversed now because some of the single uh, platform systems are, are highly versatile. Uh, so you might want to look at, uh, if you've got a starting up system or a starting up clinic, you might want to look at the pulse light systems for a start because there you can treat a wide variety of different um, uh, systems. Some of the pulse light systems also you can cont have combined with the some of the different uh, wavelength lasers in the same platform. So you can use, say, an IPL for whole facial treatment for photo damage or for um, uh, rosacea-related erythema. And you can use, say, an MDAG for targeting telangiectasia. So the answer is look at what your needs are. If you've got a very specific need, obviously, if you're going to set up a clinic where you market uh, your ability to uh, treat tattoos, then you want a ta tattoo capable laser. So it depends what type of patient profile you're looking for. That's the first thing. And then when you start approaching the companies, find ones that have a good backup, have a good local support, um, and uh, are willing to let you trial the laser uh, and come in and have also have a company that has good training expertise. So I think those are the sort of some of the broad uh, responses to that question. And it, uh, just to mention, if you've not joined us on one of our webinars before, there is just on the bottom of your screen, guys, there is a Q&A option. So if you'd like to ask any questions, then it should be towards the bottom of your screen. Each device is different, but there's a little Q&A button. And if you want to populate that with questions, we can we can ask them as we go through. So. Uh, uh, Question for you here then, uh, Dr. Lowe, what's the hardest lesson you've had to learn in your career? Good question. Um, I think generally that um, some patients are quite a lot more demanding than others uh, and you can't always predict that. So I think that's one. Uh, no, seriously, um, I think it's what we try to do is to, what I try to do is, is have a, uh, we have a full consultation. I think anybody that's getting into aesthetics really needs to realize that uh, you do need ideally to know the full medical background of the patients. And the other interesting and slightly hard thing that's that sometimes it's difficult sometimes to get all of the information from a patient. Um, and it's particularly true, it's not true so much with dermatology patients who are there with a specific problem that they want help with. With the aesthetic patients, they will often disguise or they're either embarrassed or they don't want you to know what previous treatments they've had. So I think that's quite, that was a, a lesson that uh, was hard. But when I've learned it, I, I just become um, a little bit more inquiring as regards uh, what I want to find out before embarking on a course of treatment. And one of the reasons for that is some of the patients may have had one, one example as I can think of is a few where they've had previous injectable fillers that they don't tell you about. And then you think, well, this patient may be a good candidate for an injectable filler. And then one or two of them, a small percentage have an uh, abnormal reaction to the filler that you've injected 
well, it's actually not been an in, a reaction to the filler you've been injected. It's been a result of, um, if you will, um, needle changes, damage to the previous filler. So again, accurate history, it's often not, not entirely reliable. Mm. Yeah. What's the most uh, rewarding or satisfying treatment that you do? What, what's the way you think to yourself, oh yeah, you know, I know the results are going to be great or I know this is going to go well? Yeah, I think the, um, what's the most rewarding? I think the, when, you've, you, when the patients have really done as well as they think they can, they come in and they thank you for it. Uh, they will often send uh, follow-up uh, photographs that you can see and uh, get that proof uh, of their um, of their they're happy with a, a course of treatment. Um, I think some of the um, patients that you can really get to look uh, with the dermatology perspective. Obviously, it's control of their disease, helping them with their through their disease process. Uh, and, and trying to keep them maintained and trying to educate them. So if you can get through to them in that respect, I think that's very rewarding. Um, from the aesthetic point of view, it's, um, it, it's improving while trying to minimize uh, any risk. Um, I think that's the other key. Um, trying to hold back with some patients where they are trying to get the extra treatment. So, I think a balance, but uh, happy patients would be the best uh, feedback. Yeah. And we've got a question here about pigment and treating pigment with lasers. Do you treat things like melasma at the moment with laser IPL or, or do you avoid that and just use topical? Yeah, I think a mixture of, uh, of uh, depends on, again, careful patient uh, selection. Uh, what is the skin phototype of the patient? Uh, if they're of the darker phototypes, you've got to be much more cautious or um, avoiding some of the lasers completely in that type of patient. Because with um, some of the uh, phototypes, skin phototype three and darker, uh, the risk of post laser hyperpigmentation, or indeed if it's the wrong setting and the wrong laser, some of the, uh, if you're using, for example, one of the um, Q switch lasers at too high an energy, you can then get uh, hypo as well as hyper uh, pigmentation. So I think that's a key. If you've got melasma in somebody with a phototype two skin, then what we'll often do is to combine um, uh, the uh, an, a pulse light with the correct settings, always doing a test treatment first, and then I will often alternate with a uh, other treatments, including some of the um, uh, useful peels, uh, chemical peels, a, a sequence of those. They have to be relatively mild. I'm a great believer in keeping some of the topical treatments non-inflammatory, non-irritating. I don't believe in the need for irritation because that again can make pigmentation worse. Um, They've got the patients got to be counseled as regards daily adequate sun protection with some of the melasma patients we will also put them on uh, uh, some of the um, skin lightening products as well um, both topical um, vitamin c containing products uh, uh, the correct strengths of hydroquinone uh, non-irritating retinols or low strength retinoid and um, then some of the um, melasma patients will also treat in combination with tranexamic acid, which I think still works better um, by mouth, but there are newer trends of looking at it topically as well. So all of the above. I think melasma is, the other thing is the patient has to be informed. Melasma is an ongoing problem. If you treat it, the patient themselves has to maintain any improvement by sun protection, topical treatment, and often needing intermittent peels as well. So, yeah, lasers are 
you've got to be really cautious of them with melasma and um, I think uh, some lower, some specifically targeted pulse lights are very uh, useful in the lighter skin patients, but only after small area tests. That's the other thing I think with lasers. I think more and more people need to be aware that they, there's, there's, it, it, yes, it, it, many patients don't want to be bothered by a test, but they need to be counseled that yes, mm -hmm. you need to do a test treatment and we need to evaluate that before deciding that you're the right patient for that laser or that laser is the right laser for you. And uh, if a patient does experience hypopigmentation, how long in your experience can this last before it's rectified on the client? Well, it occasionally, sadly, can be permanent. In most cases, it's certainly several weeks, usually several months. So um, again, uh, the, that all needs to be in the consent form. Uh, and certainly it's worth waiting several weeks, at least six to eight weeks after a test treatment uh, to decide on um, whether it's safe to proceed. That's impressive. So you do, you do a test patch and you'd wait many weeks before you proceed further then? Well, there's two reasons. One is you can get a delayed pigmentation response and you also want to see whether it... Um, is likely to blend in well with the with the surrounding um, uh, skin color, so I think it's worth uh, just waiting. Uh, there's no point doing a, a test patch and going in a week later. I think that uh, can mislead you. Yeah. And then in, in the other thing that's often helpful is to get them to pre-treat during that after the test patch and during that waiting period make sure they're using the topical products of the sun protection so they can be getting used to using that and that will often help the outcome uh, of the um, of the pulse light or uh, peel treatments and and do you have any tips for dealing with hypopigmentation or is that something that's uh... it depends whether it's permanent or not i mean that's one of the big problems uh, if you get permanent hypopigmentation, it's often due to um, uh, scarring. Uh, the uh, permanent hypopigmentation can be due to uh, scarring with dermal fibrosis, and that's very difficult to correct. Some of the fractional systems can help in that regard, but it is very difficult. Um, I think that um, the other, oh, the other thing I, I was going to say is some of the fractional. Uh, very superficial fractional lasers can also be used for um, some patients with um, hyperpigmentation. That's what I was going to suggest. Uh, say I forgot to say that. So yes, yeah, scarring. Um, sorry. Beam splitting, the first sort of CO twos, weren't you? So before fractional CO two existed, you were helping to split the beams to create a less aggressive form of of resurfacing. Yeah, I mean, the scattered beams of the with the computer pattern generator, which literally scattered the beam. So you could actually use relatively low fluence um, uh, and a, a diffuse pattern was, if you will, that was sort of the precursor of the of the current fractional systems. Um, I mean, the new fractional systems are very, very versatile. And depending on the wavelengths of laser, you can really... Um, get a good uh, variety of um, uses for them, even on areas of skin. And I don't advise, uh, I think you have to be very cautious when you're using any lasers and pulse lights off the face. I think the neck and decolletage can be treated, but you have to really know what you're doing and use appropriate, uh, relatively low fluences in those areas. Uh, hands and forearms and lower legs can be treated with fractional systems, but again, you have to do test areas and uh, use cautious settings but yeah hypopigmentation is a problem and it's um, mainly there you I think it's often a, an issue of trying to um, reduce the areas where there's relative hyper or normal pigmentation um, and that brings me to another uh, uh, you reminded me one of the other questions it's really important to um, uh, find out about a new patient if you're thinking of treating them with uh, lasers particularly also some peels is is there any risk of them having vitiligo 
Uh, vitiligo is a relatively common condition. It's about one to two percent of the population. And certainly if you're treating somebody uh, for pigmentation who has a, a, a family history or who have the, themselves had any areas of vitiligo, uh, you do run the risk of uh, inducing more vitiligo. So that you have to, again, uh, factor that into the patient evaluation. Mm. Lots to bear in mind. And what about the topicals that you're using? The, um, you know, what are the particular brands? You mentioned peels there. What peels and brands for topicals do you think get great results? Well, we use one um, uh, called, we'll use a variety of uh, peels. Uh, one that's quite versatile is, is called the Jessner's peel, which is a combination of resorcinol, salicylic acid. And that um, basically um, will, can be used, uh, you can vary the uh, effect of that by changing the number of uh, layers or applications you put on. So that's quite a versatile peel. I think you've got to be very, very careful with um, TCA peels. Uh, TCA peels can cause more harm than you're trying to uh, than benefit, and I think that needs to be done very carefully. There's one that we've used um, that has a, a called a vi peel that we bring. Uh, I think that's can't remember whether it's available now. We we used to get that from the states. That's quite useful for uh, pigmentation. Um, some of the glycolic peels can be used quite successfully. Again, uh, start off at a low strength and gradually build up um, uh, or, or not necessarily increase the strength. It's often safer to do repetitive peels at a relatively low strength. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the uh, products. And then the ingredients I'm looking at are obviously things like azelaic acid, uh, things like um, uh, some of the newer topical uh, skin lighteners do contain tranexamic acid. Uh, the vitamin C uh, products, I think, are quite useful as well. Um, low strength retinoids, retinol, uh, tretinoin. Again, I'm, I'm a not a believer in the need for aggressive um, retinoid uh, dermatitis, which some brands suggest. I think that's to be avoided. So a gentle approach. And I think with people with melasma, if you counsel that it's a long term or with um, lentigo, solar lentigo, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a combination approach, lasers, pulse lights, peels, and continued treatment with, with what they can do at home. Uh, and I'll also get them to put on their skin lightening creams or serum before letting it dry, then they'll put on their photo protection as well. So all of those things. It's interesting. I think you mentioned earlier, Hayley, is it, did you say it was Rosacea Week this week? Rosacea Month, yeah. Rosacea Month. What, what's, um, how would you tackle Rosacea? <coughs> what's your favourite or your, your go-to treatment? Well, I think, again, combination treatments with Rosacea. Um, uh, if it's, um, and there's different categories, uh, as you know, there's the uh, erythematous form, there's the erythematous papular form, there's the erythematous pustulo papular form, and then there's the more uh, severe forms where you have uh, um, sebaceous uh, hyperplasia with the rhinophyma, and you can actually get rhinophyma, interestingly, for whatever reason. Uh, without other manifestations of rosacea. So if you've got the erythematous form, I think the, the key is uh, definitely uh, uh, pulse light uh, and uh, some of the low fluence uh, uh, NDAG systems. We're using a very low fluence NDAG as a sort of, sort of photo facial type of treatment uh, can be quite helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Again, with the erythematous form, some of the topical products like, I think, azelaic acid, some of, I, I always try to avoid um, uh, any of the topical steroids in rosacea, uh, hydrocortisone even, because there's good evidence that you can transform stable 
or erythematous rosacea into the pustular form with um, extensive use of the topical steroids. I think some of the topical uh, agents such as uh, azelaic acid are quite useful, uh, the non-irritating forms. We have a, a serum in my own um, range uh, that was developed for acne, but also is quite useful for uh, uh, rosacea, the cleanse serum. And then the other things that um, I'll often use are on prescription are Elidel and um, uh, Protopic. Again, uh, they're non-cortisone, anti-inflammatory, anti-eczema treatments that can be actually quite helpful for uh, uh, reducing some of the erythema uh, with rosacea. So those are some of the areas for erythematous rosacea, combining them with the pulse lights. And if you've got telangiectasia, targeting the telangiectasia with the more focused ND YAG, but being very careful with the energy settings. Or if you've got a pulse dye laser, obviously um, using the, uh, that. Uh, problems with pulse dye lasers with rosacea, I've found that we tend not to use them now because, well, in our clinic because it's very difficult to get a clinical effect without producing some purpura. Yeah. Um, and so that's why we've gone over to the uh, rosacea settings, the erythema settings of our IPL and, uh, and the more diffuse, low fluence, uh, ND ag sort of photo facial. Mm. I don't know. You've done a lot of work with rosacea. What, what's what, what's your take on the optimum? Yeah, I mean certainly, I, I'm a fan of IPL for any superficial redness, actually. Um, and I think the IPL has the, the broad band. Whilst you know, when you look back at Anderson and Parrish's work, you'd say, well, it's going to be less selective. Some of the studies I've done is it suggests that actually having a, a, a broader wavelength range allows for um, more depth of penetration across a, a capillary. So you don't concentrate all the energy into a small volume of hemoglobin and burst the vessel open. You actually allow sort of longer wavelengths to, to be absorbed deeper in the vessels and the capillaries. And so you can cause necrosis without having to burst open the blood vessel. So you can I think IPL has that the advantage because it's broader band of um, getting the result you need without having to cause that uh, bruising effect on the on the skin at the same time. Mm. You know. So yeah, I'm a fan of superficial uh, capillaries of any sort. I think uh, an IPL on lighter coloured skins. It works exceptionally well, actually. Not, not all IPLs, that's the only thing I would say. It's, um, it's a bit tricky. You have to have quite short pulses and sufficient fluence in the right wavelength range. It's easy to just stick a light bulb in a box and call it an IPL, but they're not, uh, you have to think carefully about those the balance between pulse duration, wavelength range, and, the, and sufficient fluence. And it is a balancing act, and you can't just optimize one without optimizing all three, really, to get to get the, the good results. Mm. Yeah, no, that's great, uh, great advice, and uh, I think it bears out what we said earlier, and that's um, if you're getting into selecting uh, buying a, a, an IPL system, do look carefully at the expertise uh, behind them, because um, uh, that's critical. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't realise, but um, I read a statistic recently that said that 10% of the population suffer from rosacea. In your experience, is it is it getting worse? Because obviously I, I, I'm hearing things about asthma and, and eczema, people in that, um, that sort of uh, that suffer from these concerns are on the rise. Have you noticed a rise in skin diseases and concerns like rosacea? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've never quite know, and I don't think there's a data at the moment to say whether it's a true increase incidence. But um, I think we've, because we've got much better treatments now for erythematous rosacea, for the papillopustular, for all forms, uh, I think that um, there's probably more patients coming for 
that treatment mm -hmm. as they become aware of it. Things like the Rosacea Foundations um, uh, in the both this country as well as in the United States, again with patient education, I think have helped um, guide those people that uh, have the problem to seek it. But yeah, I suspect at least in the Caucasian proper population, it, it probably is 10% uh, at least of the uh, general population. It is higher in certain ethnic groups such as uh, the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, the Celtic uh, origin. <coughs> uh, I have pretty fair phototype one to two skin, so I'll have intermittent uh, erythematous rosacea. The other thing that's often associated with rosacea, as I see a lot clinically, is the overlap between facial type of eczema, which we often call seborrheic eczema, and rosacea. And it often seems to go together and there's an overlap of those two conditions. And um, that's one of the reasons why I will often combine some of the specific rosacea treatments uh, topically like um, uh, the um, uh, metronidazole gels, um, like the uh, Solantra gels and creams for the rosacea, plus the ant low dose antibiotics. I'll often combine that with um, uh, a seborrheic eczema treatment, such as combining um, uh, the Elidel with a topical um, anti. Ye uh, yeast agent, uh, which helps the seborrheic eczema. So again, uh, those two conditions can go along together. So again, that's another reason I think why we're probably seeing uh, that that is a true incidence uh, of 10% or higher. The other interesting thing is that there's more and more where we get more involved as, as certainly dermatologists have been of treating uh, skin of color, the darker phototype uh, patients they uh, actually do have rosacea and uh, you just don't see it as erythema. They feel it as, as irritation of discomfort um, and you see it often as a darkening of their skin uh, phototype because of the back uh, underlying uh, erythema. Now there you've got to be very cautious because most of the laser systems won't be applicable there and what we can rely on is the is the medical treatments the uh, antibiotics the uh, appropriate topical treatments that we've talked about um, and so forth so again it's not only Caucasians that have rosacea but the treatments differ between the different skin types and you know? um, I've got a question here from the audience hi Victoria uh, how do hormones affect rosacea yeah, that's a good point, and that's actually something I should have uh, mentioned. Good question. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, there's there's a, a, a time that rosacea does get worse, and that's in the perimenopausal situation where you're getting facial flushing in many women. So that can be a, a time when uh, the rosacea starts to, for the first time, or if they've had it before, those uh, women will get it worse at that time. So again, that's uh, very common. Again, I've noticed rosacea at times made worse by certain oral contraception. I've noticed uh, that it can be linked with um, IVF treatments. Um, and so definitely hormonal fluctuation can definitely precipitate rosacea. And uh, of course, it's interesting that tranexamic acid, I don't know whether it's ever been looked at specifically in rosacea, I'm sure it has, but uh, that, I've just thought that might be something else to look at uh, as regards seeing if it will stabilize rosacea. Um, anyway, those, those are some of the thoughts. Uh, uh, yes, it's definitely linked with, um, in, in many women with uh, hormonal fluctuation. And is that just because the, that alters the vas the vascularity, or what? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So, sorry, we should have talked about mechanisms of action. Let's talk about what rosacea yeah. is. You know, and, and and I understand there's still no, we don't still know exactly what causes rosacea. Is that right? Well, I think there's lots of clues that uh, it is a vasoactive uh, disease. 
that uh, causes facial enlar enlargement of primarily the uh, superficial vessels of the face. And, and that can be due to, we know that estrogens, for example, will increase uh, blood flow. Uh, so that's probably the mechanism there. We know that um, rosacea patients, when they have changing temperatures, they seem to be specifically um, sensitive to, if you walk from, a, dark, uh, from a, a cold outdoors into a hot car or a hot room, that vasodilatation will increase the flushing and worsen the rosacea. That's probably why it's in some patients it seems to be worse in the winter and in the cold weather coming into changing temperatures. Um, there's some evidence that there's a, an increase of uh, vasoactive peptides that you can identify in rosaceous skin. Um, and then there's also this uh, perennial um, question of what exactly do the, um, the microflora the, the, uh, have uh, on rosacea, uh, the microparasites that are present in the sebaceous glands, uh, they are thought to play a role. Uh, and whether that, that probably uh, occurs because they produce um, an increase in the um, irritation, the vascular dilatation, the irritancy, inflammatory cascade that then uh, leads to uh, uh, rosacea. So that's one of the reasons why some types of rosacea do extremely well with um, uh, treatments such as uh, Sulantra which is the one that's aimed to reduce those microparasites. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, all of the above, um, are, I think said the mechanisms, I'm sure there'll be other uh, things that we identify uh, with future research. Mm -hmm. uh, Whatever happened to KTP for treating capillaries? That's a laser that you don't hear about much anymore, isn't it? It is, and I don't know why we don't, because I mean, it was quite effective for treating um, uh, the more, you know, the 532 nanometer KTPs, uh, treating uh, superficial vessels. And I think it is quite still uh, a useful treatment. So if anybody has that machine, certainly uh, mm. I think for targeted t injectaser, it's very good. Mm. Was there ever, a, did they ever develop a more diffuse delivery KTP? No, I guess that's the problem with it. I mean, KTP is just uh, a, a, a pump, pumped by an ND YAG anyway. Right, yeah. So, um, so I always found it was, I mean, it's highly effective, but but you literally had to trace the, the capillary, didn't you? That's, you know, it wasn't yeah. as uh, versatile, I guess, in, in, in how you applied it. So, and it's well, quite yeah, aggressive, I think. It's commercial decisions that clinics have to make as well now, isn't it? You know, in terms of if you if you are the business that can afford a standalone vascular platform, then that might be what you go for. Whereas, like like Nick says, with IPL, you get so many more out, you know, so much more output from it with yes. a lower investment. So, I think some of the technologies we've seen come and go. It's it's more commercial, isn't it? The decisions that possibly true yeah market yeah. sort of driving so yeah. no i'm sure that's right i'm just uh looking something up here yes. yeah no go ahead yeah so um what do you wish that you had um known sooner in life <laughs> Um, that you would, you would, if you could reverse twenty years and and carry a, a bit of knowledge with you, what would it be? Oh, good. Ugh, I don't know. I hadn't thought of that. Um, probably spending more time with my kids. But you um, know what? I, I've asked that question to about four people now, and that's the answer that I've had. Yeah, I think that's definitely, uh, and I wouldn't have been quite so in, uh, impulsive as regards um, uh, and the, my earlier life putting in. Uh, more work, uh, I'd have tried to do uh, a better balance, I think would be uh, my, if I had a wish list. <laughs> mm. It's interesting that most people are saying that and perhaps now is a turning point for us in society to uh, regroup and reflect and think about that. Yeah, I don't well, know. Well. 
I was going to say, I've just spent a, a week locked away with my three kids. I'm not sure I agree entirely. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well for, for my two daughters are a, a wee bit older, so they've got their own kids. So, uh, uh, in fact, we're fortunate because we, we're living up in Cheshire at the moment, next door to our daughter and uh, grandkids that's, uh, there. So, actually, not too far from you in... Uh, in uh, oh, just around the corner yeah in, in Bowdoin yeah so uh, I would say that one of the great things is that is being able to spend more time with the grandchildren I mean one of the uh, uh, one of my grandsons is a, a, a top uh, golfer at 15 so he's uh, got me out on the golf course and of course we can't do that now uh, so uh, I'm hoping uh, that's something I'm looking forward to when the we can start relaxing. So uh, yeah, so uh, but yeah, I wish I'd have uh, had a better uh, balance. But at that time, when I was uh, certainly in in medical school and then in uh, uh, decided to specialise, you really uh, were more or less expected to uh, put in as much effort as possible uh, work-wise. Otherwise quote, you might not succeed, whatever that success was yeah. quoted to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question, an in interesting one for us to debate um, from nurse uh, Maria Brennan Thorns, who I think you may be aware of. Um, yeah, sure. Hi, Maria. She has asked, um, how do you feel about the deregulation of lasers in our field? Has, has laser become now commoditized? Well, my feeling is that lasers uh, should be restricted to people who know what they're doing with them. And that's uh, ideally um, people who've been uh, thoroughly trained, people who are uh, ideally um, medics, nurse practitioners, um, and, and the people in the clinics using them uh, ideally would be um, staff that have to go through very specific training. I think that's the whole one of the big problems in this country is the aesthetics. Well, it's not just this country, but uh, the aesthetics industry has uh, become um, out of control. I mean, I keep saying that uh, fillers, for example, why on earth don't they reclassify them so that only uh, uh, physicians, surgeons, mm -hmm. nurse practitioners could actually inject them? Um, whereas uh, I don't think the same should have been the case with lasers, but um, I'm afraid uh, there doesn't seem, and that there's, there's, the world has a few other worries just at this precise moment. Uh, so I think that it won't be changed, but yeah, I, I, get, I think from Maria, she's probably thinking the same. I think I mean, in, the, in the States, it's much more regulated, isn't it? I mean, my understanding is that there's much more, um, definition about who can and can't use lasers is that correct it depends on which state you uh, are living in but yes many of the states have much greater regulation uh, that's absolutely correct mm -hmm. i think the uk has uh, also way behind other european countries in its regulation i think for example france and germany have much uh, greater regulation uh, than we do here and um uh that's historically uh, have been the case. Mm. But I think uh, that's another reason why uh, the companies themselves that produce uh, medical devices need to be really um, uh, at the top of their game as regards selection and uh, of pr of practitioners and uh, uh, training. Mm. Yeah. I think we've, we've been pleased to see the uh, new frameworks put in place, haven't we, in regards to level fours, level five, six, and seven. So like, it doesn't yeah, seem to have had quite the traction that we'd like at this point, but it is moving in the right direction. Yeah, those will help, definitely. Yeah. It's a good start, isn't it? But it is just a start. I mean, the, the problem with any of these voluntary frameworks is they're voluntary. And I think um, it, hopefully, as we move forward, they'll become a bit more structured and a bit more backing for that to be more mandatory. I mean, I'm a big believer in training and, and people using lasers should be trained proficiently and, and competently, really. And that's a, it's not about just listening to some sales guy to tell you which buttons to press. Yeah. You should demonstrate competency, really. And once you can do that, then I think 
you know, I, I'm comfortable with people. As long as they're competent, doing a lot of the treatments, you know, the, the practicality of the treatment's not too difficult in many circumstances. I'm not talking about all lasers here, but certainly some basic treatments. Um, but we should still demonstrate that you, you're capable of doing that. And at the moment, these frameworks are good and they've outlined how training courses could run, but, but they're still only a voluntary step. And I think mm. there's a, a good movement in the right direction, but just needs a bit more. It does, and it, it does. It is still quite amazing that you could buy an an NDAG laser on eBay and use it now. I mean, that, yeah. we, that's astonishing, really, isn't it? That that yeah, that, yeah that, No, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for people. So, it, it's, but hopefully, it's, it's we'll, slight, slightly crazy. Yeah. The, um, yeah. I, I think one of the things that frustrates um, uh, physicians, surgeons, nurse practitioners are the fact that we are now regulated uh, with having to get yearly uh, appraisals, General Medical Council, General Nursing Council, we have mm. to go through all of the reappraisals. We are, if you will, regulated, over-regulated to the extreme, whereas this big gap where there's uh, people who have no um, regulatory uh, uh, um, yeah. restrictions whatsoever can uh, indulge in in these sort of, uh, some of these treatments mm. and it certainly is very dangerous to the public and um, mm. it does need to be uh, corrected mm. so uh, I agree. I, it, I think if you, if you look at the perhaps the other the other way of looking I guess at that question in terms of have the treatments become a commodity you know regard, regardless of who's doing the treatments it still doesn't feel to me like we have treated a particularly high percentage of the population for hair removal for example you know hair removal being probably one of the most popular treatments um with lasers and ipls at the moment there's still so many of my friends and family that don't know what laser or ipl is for hair removal so the market's still there in terms of have we reached saturation no I don't think so. I feel like there's still a booming market of uh, out there, people that still don't know the amazing work that goes on within our clinics and what can be treated and what results can be achieved. Um, so that's heartening, I think, for anyone who's running a clinic at the moment to know that there's, there still feels like a much, a lot of growth to be had still. It's a, bo it's a booming industry, which is nice and reassuring knowing that we're coming back into an industry that should be fairly resilient to you know the, the problems we face right now. I'm sure you're right that uh, there will be a return of uh, demand there is a huge demand out there and um, and uh, for the more sophisticated public I think uh, uh, there will still be that uh, demand. I think some of the newer uh, treatment options that come out in aesthetics are being developed uh, all the time some of the um, body contouring uh, systems some of the uh, non-invasive skin tightening lifting systems often used um, certainly on the face and hands for example you can combine different types of skin rejuvenation treatments uh, fillers neurotoxins lasers radio frequency um, ultrasound uh, microwave, all, all of those combinations uh, that we've got really a big repertoire of, uh, of treatments that we can offer. So yeah, I agree with you. I think that there's a big opportunity to, to grow it, uh, uh, hopefully in a, in, a, in, a, in a skilled fashion. And uh, there's an interesting question here, which I'm, I'm interested to know as well. Have you tried using a plasma pen? Have you any experience with the plasma pens? Are you doing that in your clinic at the moment? We have looked at plasma systems. Um, to be perfectly blunt, I'm still trying to convince myself that they are uh, any advantage over uh, selected lasers. Um, some of the plasma systems uh, can give you, one of the thoughts was, well, it will not give any downtime. There's no superficial skin damage. Actually, some of the plasma systems can give superficial skin damage uh, that we've seen. So. Again, I think it's a system that uh, that needs to be thoroughly investigated, and there's there's like there are many different powers and uh, 
types of laser so uh, you have to be selective about what you're trying to use it for mm. we, have you had have you had any uh, experience yeah. with the plasma systems at linton so we regularly um, are approached by you know different manufacturers across the world that would like us to represent them in the uk and we had a number of um, plasma devices that we looked at but much much the same as yourself really we had I think they're very operator dependent very operator dependent mm -hmm. and the problem is um that if you get it wrong you know we have seen actually some of our own um customers who've had treatments elsewhere get actual you know a pitted scarring um and a quite a high instance of um hyperpigmentation so you know in comparison to using um, a pulse light or radio frequency or a YAG, a YAG even to do tightening and of course CO2, it, it feels as though the, sa the safety levels weren't quite up to scratch with it for us yet. So interesting technology but not quite there yet. I agree with you entirely. I have seen uh, several patients that have had um, uh, plasma treatments and have had, as you absolutely accurately described, these little pitted scars with long lasting, uh, if not permanent hypopigmentation. And actually the, uh, some of the downtime recovery is, uh, is actually has been the ones that I've seen. And we've not, uh, we trialed one in the clinic. I won't say which one, but um, the downtime was actually quite significant. Uh, certainly longer than, um, than uh, well, there's very little downtime usually with, uh, the IPL or the or the fractional systems, if if they use correctly, um, but yeah, no, I, I think um, I think the word plasma, you know, plasma, it, it's a it's it's been uh, thought of as a great marketing tool. It's sort of the future, but mm -hmm. uh, I think we need to rein it back and uh, do some more systematic research before um, before uh, uh, it should be let loose. Uh, and what if any new technologies are you looking at for the future of your clinic? Is there anything new on the horizon for you? Yeah, well, I think uh, I'd like to see um, some, I mean, I, I, what what new technologies are we looking at? Well, we've done that. We've been doing, uh, for example, uh, cryolipolysis, uh, cool sculpting for, for many years since I think we were one of the early ones to do that. I think combining that with uh, systems for body contouring that will help uh, further. So combinations with um, microwave technology, that type of thing, see if we can improve things like uh, cellulite. Um, cellulite is still a, treat, uh, a condition that's, uh, that's waiting for good treatments. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's certainly uh, something to, to look at. Most of the existing treatments are quite temporary. Um, and so that's a, a, an area of importance. Mm -hmm. I think um, some of the, we're looking at, uh, it'd be nice uh, to look at some of the um, more refined delivery for um, microwave and uh, ultrasound technology. Uh, I think that's another system that, uh, that would be worthwhile. Radio frequency. Um, again, there's some really interesting systems out there, some of which we're looking at at the moment to see if, uh, again, we can um, combine things. And, and again, it, 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 all of this type of uh, will, will help. Um, what else would I say? Um, I think um, an area that certainly has a lot of hype and needs uh, a lot more research are the uh, so-called stem cell technology treatments. Um, uh, one of the people at our clinic is, is, is specializing in that research. And uh, it's something that I think will be useful. Will it be useful as a standalone treatment for rejuvenation? I think much like uh, our experience with some of the other systems, uh, some of the other combining we need to do combination treatments to often in many patients to get the optimum results. Uh, if you've got surface photo damage with lentigo, surface writings, color change, 
that surface damage can be treated with pulse lights or appropriate laser. The deeper um, uh, wrinkling, sagging, uh, deeper atrophic scars, uh, that can all be helped with some of the uh, injectables, the collagen injectable and stimulating injectables, the hyaluronic uh, fillers. But again, that's somewhere where I suspect that the um, stem cell injectables uh, can be helped. And there's going to be newer um, ways of delivering stem cells, um, certainly that are superior to some of the existing uh, platelet-derived systems, for example. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think all of the above, really. Um, yeah. Good, great. So, um, a, a final question for you. What, what do you think that patients are really looking for in an aesthetic clinic? What do you think is really important to them? Well, I think what they should be looking for is, um, is, is the background experience of the, uh, of the uh, clinic um, uh, practitioners. And by that, I mean, in, in my opinion, depending on the level of treatment, if you're talking about serious treatments, uh, skin disease treatments, um, different skin phototypes, all of the above. I think it definitely should be physician-led, uh, preferably. Some nurse practitioners are excellent as well. Um, they need to be the leaders. They need to be thoroughly uh, trained themselves in all of the treatments and in the, in the patient uh, selection and in the patient examination, all of the above that they're going to offer. So don't believe for the patients. Uh, I think the patient shouldn't just believe uh, uh, advertising. It's all too easy to come up with very clever, um, uh, impressive websites, et cetera. I think you really need to um, be more skeptical of that. And uh, all of those sort of things are important. Uh, so really look at the quality of the staff, uh, ask them uh, if they have any patient, uh, ask for treatment photographs that are derived from the clinic itself. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very important. Um, make sure that they're uh, given consent forms, um, uh, patient information that they need to look at and be sent away to re make sure that you're given enough time to ask questions, to reflect on uh, treatments that are being offered, all of that. It'd be suspicious about a clinic that wants to jump in immediately and treat you the first time they see you. So I, I like to say for aesthetic treatments, it's different for some dermatology treatments, but for aesthetic treatments, um, the, the uh, no aesthetic treatment is, is an emergency. You can take your time to uh, review all the information. Mm. And where do you go to, to um, are the, what, what are the good resources you use to upskill yourself, to keep training, to keep learning? What are the sort of um, recommendations you have for ongoing education? Um, well, I tell you what we have to do as, as regards physicians, uh, we have to go to uh, so many uh, approved continuing medical education uh, seminars per year. Uh, we can also uh, get CME approval for webinars. Um, so I think that could be developed more. Um, journal reading is another key thing that I do. Um, but again, um, I think that's the other thing the patients could uh, ask for is proof of that type of um, education training that the, con that the clinic continues to um, to th uh, to um, uh, indulge in to 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 get into. Uh, I think that's that very important. You're doing yeah. ongoing training and keeping up to date with the latest techniques. Yeah, that's all very important because uh, you know things change and uh, and new treatments that are, are proposed uh, can develop uh, unexpected side effects. So all of that ongoing education is, is greatly important and. Mm -hmm. Again, Care Quality Commission approved clinics don't necessarily uh, go into that. Um, whereas people who have to be appraised by 
General Medical Council, General Nursing Council, they do have to prove that they've uh, that they have uh, been through that uh, required education. And resources for upskilling your estheticians? Well, I think make sure the clinic uh, does the a send the clinic uh, the uh, technicians to appropriate meetings. Uh, we have regular staff meetings where we train and teach the uh, aestheticians, make sure the aestheticians are uh, up to speed on all of the latest uh, for which for particular equipment they're using, ask them to see uh, some of the companies will give certificates of training, all of those sort of things. Don't be afraid as a patient to ask for evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And now is a great time, obviously, for everyone to jump online and learn as much as they can from all the different providers. Mm -hmm. So yes yes at the moment isn't it to upskill in different areas absolutely yeah agree so any good things coming out of the current situation for you um good question i'm not sure probably i'm fitter than i was because i'm walking a lot more mm -hmm. as i said now from the point of view of um uh well preparing for things like this webinar has let me reflect on some of the things we're offering and some of the treatments so yeah i have certainly more time to read and reflect and uh, and actually um uh i just uh, successfully submitted my reappraisal for the year last week so all those sort of things whereas uh i've been trying to juggle all of those uh in my uh evenings and leisure time compared to now yeah. we've got more time to keep up to date having said that i, I do hope that we're as soon as possible back to uh, clinical uh, activities yeah yeah we're all hoping for that aren't we mm. yeah well thank you ever so much that's well thank you no that's been uh, very interesting and uh, really and interesting to, yeah hopefully it's been useful for people yeah certainly yeah, thank you Great question. And it'd, be, it'd be good to come up with it, depending on how long this lockdown is, with some uh, specific targeted uh, webinars on uh, some specific treatment uh, programs. We could yeah. do acne. That would be an interesting one. With what, sorry? Acne. Yes, with acne. I think yeah. acne is uh, something that uh, a lot of people are, um, it's ongoing and uh, it will continue to be out there regardless of what else is happening. Mm. So, and there's a lot that we can do for acne um, by literally tele uh, dermatology uh, webinars and, uh, and self help. So, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 And coming into, uh, if we're still allowed to walk outside, uh, coming into spring and early summer. Uh, how uh, details on photo protection and at risk and those sort of things. Yep. SPF, yeah. I think there's some great ideas. So certainly, you know, we're looking at doing a, a sequence of webinars and Hay and I were talking the other day, we, we, we don't know how long this is going to last, so it will unfold as it unfolds. Mm. But I think there, there are some great ideas we could come back to for sure. Mm. No, that would be great. And also, don't forget, you can then recycle those webinars uh, when mm. we're all back to normal anyway as yeah. additional uh, uh, educational items. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think it will change us forever, this. <laughs> I think the other thing that you could do, I mean, for example, um, we could also think about doing uh, a, a sort of journal club for uh, professionals. Um, taking some of the journals that obviously are still online as well as uh, in paper and then reviewing, disc, having a discussion, uh, for example, we've got our own, we've, Gary Lask and myself founded the Journal of Cosmetic and Laser Therapy some years ago and um, that's uh, certainly something you could also review some of the other la uh, laser related aesthetic journals. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. That's an interesting yeah, idea. idea. Good. Great. Well, when we're when when we're out and allowed to drive out and about, I'll come and visit you in the uh, in yeah. Home Chapel. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you must drive back. past the you, you <laughs> must drive past the door on the way up to Bowden. So. Yeah, no, I will. That's right. That's yeah. right. Especially yeah. when the M6 is blocked in various places. <laughs> yeah. yeah, come off and have a coffee. <laughs> yeah, good idea. 
Okay. Thanks, thanks Dr. All right, thanks ever so much. So are you going to leave this webinar up or what are you going to do? So we will um, put this onto our YouTube channel. So Great. people can access it there and I'll send you a link. So You'll you send me a link. Start. That's lovely. Okay. All right. Well, call, call when, you, when you want more uh, input, input. Super. Great. Bye. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks a lot. Thank bye. you. Thanks, thanks Hayley. Bye. Thanks. Bye.